What is going on, everybody? Hope you are having a wonderful week so far. Uh, before we start, you know the score. Hit subscribe. Give us some comments in the reviews. Whatever you can do, share it with your mate. Share. Oh, I just dropped my ring. Um, share it with people that would mean the world. I'd love you forever if you did that. This week on the podcast, <coughs> I'm really excited about this one. Um, it's really nice to see this podcast kind of get to a point where I can ask artists at the level of this next guest um, and they open their arms and say, I'd absolutely love to. Cascade. One of the biggest names in electronic music ever, which is crazy. Um, he's had insane success when it comes to releasing music, playing shows. Um, and I wanted to get him on the podcast and talk about it because he's had an amazing story. Um, and we all know with what happens with amazing success is how hard somebody works and the hard times and what you miss out on. Um, and I really wanted to get him on the, on the podcast and, and talk about that. And it was an amazing conversation. I really liked it. I learned a lot. Um, I learned a lot of things that I didn't know about, about him. Um, and we just, yeah, had some really great kind of conversations as well. So without further ado, Cascade. Third time lucky. <laughs> Sorry. <Jeez. laughs> I think Jeez, dude. The, the last time was my fault. Because I didn't I mean, look at all, the time. We're here and it's happening now. And that's all that really matters. It's all this true. happening. Dude. This is true. How you doing, man? I'm good. Thank you. How are you? Yeah, really good, man. Thank you for thank you for coming on. Um it's great to have you on and it's great to actually like I don't think we've met in person. I don't think we met before. Which is crazy to me. <laughs> Um, I'm sure we probably passed one another, I don't know, at a festival yeah. or in the airport or something. And I was probably too asleep to even notice. <laughs> <laughs> Story of our lives, right? Touring life. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> um, where are you in the world right now? Uh, I'm home. Um, I'm here in LA and it's raining a lot here. We're mm. in the middle of some kind of atmospheric river it's been raining yeah. for two days straight um which is unusual but yeah i'm based here uh in los angeles i have been for uh i don't know 11 12 years oh wow i've got a studio in santa monica i'm here on the west side right close to the ocean which is nice where i where i prefer to be do you surf i do um i started I grew up skateboarding and doing all that and snowboarding and whatnot. And then like every person, when they moved to California, I bought a surfboard. Actually, my <laughs> wife bought it for me as a like, birthday <laughs> present. I was like, yes. I'm like, what are you saying? You want me to surf? Uh, and you know, surfing is really, really, really hard. Um, yeah. Like really hard. And I am so bummed that I found it so late in life because – I love it more than anything. Um, but really, when I found it, uh, you know, when I moved here, whatever, 12 years ago, I would do it like three or four times a year and I would mm. suck because it would be so hard. And I'd be like, this is impossible. So during COVID, um, I have a house that's actually in San Clemente, which is kind of like America's surf capital. Um, okay. Kelly Slater's got a house there and uh, okay. I was like, this is it. This is my freaking, this is my chance to actually surf. So for that year, um, I mean, for the first five or six months I stayed here in my house in LA and like, was like, it's, it's going to open back up any minute. And like I was producing a ton of music and streaming and stuff. And then when it was pretty apparent that like, oh yeah, this isn't happening and my kids aren't going back to school. I was like, all right, we're going down to the beach house and I'm going to surf every day. So I surfed like five, six days a week for about a year. And that's really kind of when I got into it. So mm. yeah, very late in life. Amazing. There's something, you, you said something that's like, it's very, very hard. 
Um, there's something about doing hard things later on in life that sucks even more so from when you're, <laughs> from what I remember from when you're a kid. Like yep. <laughs> I was, I went to see my niece and nephews play rugby. Like I'm from like a big rugby family and on the weekend and I was just like, I'd love to go and play rugby again. I'd absolutely love to, but I know how hard it's going to be. And the thought of just being absolutely battered, like the day after, the week after, it's just, it's just so demoralizing, especially being getting a little bit older. And it's just like, I don't know if I can do that. Yeah, the recovery time is totally different. Like you yeah. don't, you get beat up and... Yeah, I mean, I used to skate, skateboard a lot. Um, I grew up skating. That was kind of my go-to sport. Um, yeah. And as I got older, I just like less and less. I still go out and skate a little bit now, but, but man, it's just when you fall, I'm just like, oh my gosh, this is going to hurt for like yeah. two weeks now. <laughs> so yeah, I don't do it as much. I, that's why I prefer surfing because I don't get as beat up and it keeps me in better condition. Honestly, yeah. I think the best condition I've ever been in in my life was that year during COVID. I was like walking around with my shirt off, just like, what up, man? What's Feeling happening? great. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, look at me. I'm a poster for health. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting, though, when you actually have time for yourself or because we all can make time for ourselves, right? We can all make a choice to go to the gym to be fit and healthy and to kind of ha have that way of life. But life gets caught up and it's very easy to kind of get caught back on the rat race of touring and, and all of the kids and all of the family stuff that you have to do and everything like that, writing music, et cetera, et cetera. And then you forget that like the health generally always comes last in a lot of situations that is, I don't know if, I don't know if you're the same. I, I have to train. I have to go to the gym, but there's a, there's a level of like, it's really hard to stay healthy. It's insanely hard. I, well, there's a couple of things there. I learned that the hard way because I got really unhealthy. Um, mm. You know, when I was a kid, whatever, it's easy when you're in like grade, middle school, yeah. grade school, high school, like, I'm doing all these sports. I played soccer, uh, guys version of football, whatever. Yeah. And I track and field and I was doing all this stuff. Then when you graduate and kind of, that's when I started going into the studio more. Yeah. And there was like probably a window of like three or four years where I just sat in my basement <laughs> and didn't do anything except try and figure out how to make music. Yeah. Um, and like I was just eating pizza and I was playing a few gigs uh, just at my local pub at that time. So it's like, that's the only time I left the house. And like, I look at pictures from back then and I'm just like, wow, who is that person? I don't, I don't know. But I think honestly, this is for me, I have this conversation every once in a while with guys that are kind of starting out. I'm like, look, the thing that I had trouble with, like my biggest kind of caution of people getting into this when I talk to young dudes is that it's when you do what you love, it's so hard to say no. Yeah. Like even like, dude, I've been in this industry almost 30 years. And like, even to this day, you know, my manager's emailing me this or that and these different offers. It's like, I don't, I say yes to so much. It's, it's been this huge challenge and like something that has been very costly to me to, to learn this is to no, you got to say no, you got to, you know, you got to make sure you have time to train, hit the gym, do your things and have your life on the side. Yeah. Because if you do what you love, it just can take over everything. I mean, there was yeah. a huge period of my career where I really didn't have much of a life outside of the studio and touring. It's yeah. like the little bit of time that I did have was like going to my wife and children, but they were only getting a little because it's like I had all this other stuff and my career was just on this crazy, like like when that whole EDM boom happened, yeah. 
I was just like, people actually want to pay me to do this? Like, a lot of money? This is nuts. Like, it, for yeah. sure, this is not going to be here tomorrow. I have to take this show. You don't understand. This is no way somebody will pay me this amount of money two years from now or a year from now. Mm -hmm. So I just was like, yes, yes, yes. And that snowballed into, <laughs> like, at one point, I'm like, wait, what am I what, you know, I remember an interviewer asking me, like, what do you do in your free time? I'm like, free time? <laughs> what the? Free time? People have that? That's like a thing? And I'm like, uh, in my previous life, I used to, like, skate and snowboard. And, like, I, like, I mean, I didn't say that. I played it cool. It was like, oh, yeah, I go snowboarding. But at that point, I was like, I had only snowboarding. Like, three days yeah. that season. Or yeah. I hadn't ridden in a few years, you know. So anyway, it's, that's always it's my tough. cautionary it's tough. tale. It's tough though, isn't it? Because I think in hindsight, right? And I guess, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a pretty fair question. Would you, would you have changed it? If you could go and do it all again, would you change? Would you change anything? No. Yeah. I wouldn't. I and, mean... I, and I knew that would be the answer. Because it... I, yeah. I think I think that's the thing is like there comes a point and I and I see it through touring I see it in myself I see it in friends and I see it having these conversations that that at some point in everyone's career there is that hustle and I hate kind of using that word I do, or dislike using that word but there's that period in their life where nothing else matters and and you have to go through that to get out the other side and to get to the point where you can sit back and go yeah you know what that was fucking crazy but it's got me me to where i'm at if you didn't do that stage in your career and you took it easy you kind of did that the the road could have looked very different for you i wouldn't be sitting here talking to you no, but it's it, it, you have to have. I, I've been following John Summit's career for a while now. Um, yeah, one because he grew up not far from where I grew up. He's a you know suburban Chicago kid. He grew up in yeah. Naperville. I grew up in Northbrook. He's like right down the road from me. Um, yeah. So I'm kind of fascinated with. He's a cool guy, and I think he's talented, and and I'm enjoying kind of watching this you know, kid from the neighborhood kind of have a moment that's yeah. enjoyable for me. And he said something like this, you know, I'm just grinding so hard right now. And he, he's in that, right. He's in that pocket. Yeah. And it's like, what he was saying is that, you know, I'm glad that I worked in the professional world. He was a CPA, I think before, you know, doing people's taxes and whatnot. Cause he's like, it taught me dedication and hard work, you know, staying at the office till like 10 o'clock at night to get it done and meet those deadlines. Yeah. He understood that. I think from the outside, you look at this and it just, people are like, Oh my gosh, you know, popping yeah. bottles, making beats, whatever. Eh, check me out in the studio. It's all fun and games. It's like, no, there's a period of time when you really are just like getting run through this machine and just beat up and, and, you know, so dedicated to make it work. Um, or you believe in the dream or you believe in music you're making or whatever, you know, whatever, everyone's got a different story. Um, but if you don't, if you, if you're not willing to do that, it's probably not going to happen for you. Yeah. I mean, you really got to give it all. No, I agree. And I think everybody in their own niche world, and I, I don't think it's just music. I think it's in in every walk of life. If if there wants sure. to be a, a level of, I don't know if the success is the right word because I don't, it depends what success is to, to the, you as an individual. But like if you want something that's going to last a long time, that that hard work, that grind has to be put in at some point somehow. Um, and what i am interested in asking you is do you ever feel like now you're not i know you still work bloody hard and and you're you kind of but your life's changed do you ever feel lazy uh yeah yes mm. it really for me 
I'll tell you when the big change was for me. Because I, when people are like, well, what was that grind? Was that a few years? No, I think there's a, a decade or more yeah. what was really just nothing but this. I wake up, I knew what I had to do, and I was going to sleep with like the list for tomorrow. Like, okay, I got to finish that song or I got to finish this remix or I got to go into the studio. Okay, I got to buy tickets for this show that's coming up or whatever it was. You know, it was just always, there was always yeah. another thing. The list just yeah. kept growing. Um, so, I, you know, we have that period of time. Um, I kind of lost my train of thought of where I wanted to take that. I, it was talking about being lazy, the feeling of being lazy now and what you're yeah, saying. So, is that, uh, so, okay. So COVID happens, right? And COVID yeah. for me happened at like the most, it, it was, I think kind of like saved my life. The mm. irony of that, because I was so beat up from the road. Yeah because I was having so many opportunities come through and I just was having a hard time managing that. Um, so when everything turned off, it was a moment for me to kind of like take a step back and it still took me a couple months to like decompress and unwind yeah. and have some perspective. Like really, am I really going to do 200 shows this year? <laughs> like what's the point, it's crazy. man? You know, um, I need to, I need to relax. I need to, I need to just kind of like, okay. And then it was like, okay, I don't want to do that remix or I just want to focus on this EP or whatever. So as things settled down and I kind of got a rhythm and I got surfing all the time and got really healthy physically, I was like, okay, cool. When I go back, here's the number that I'm going to do. <laughs> this is it. This is the amount of shows that I want to do that I think will fit in my schedule. And here's how much music I'm going to set aside. How much time I'm going to set aside to make music. Whatever comes yeah. out of that, cool. If that's an album, if that's an EP, if that's one remix, whatever it is, yeah. that's it. Here it is. And then I did a year of that and I was like, okay, cool. And then last year I kind of went back and reconstructed that like, oh, a little bit more of this and a little bit less of that. So I think for the first time in my career, you know, whatever, 30 years later, I'm like, I'm kind of at a good pace, but certainly when I look back at the old me who was doing 200 plus shows a year, I, I can feel a little bit lazy, but yeah. I also feel like I've earned that. Like I don't like, dude, I have this amazing facility 10 minutes from my house, the studio that it, it's literally the studio of my dreams. Eight years ago, I did a big Vegas deal and I got a massive check up front. And I was like, I mean, I, I'm here at my kitchen counter right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's where I've done a lot of my writing is at the dining room table or the kitchen mm -hmm. table on my laptop a couple yeah. since like, so I have so many sessions that were done that way. So I was like, I'm going to build this place out. And what's crazy is it sits empty 80% of the time. Yeah. And there's no guilt there anymore. Before I'd be like, oh my gosh, I got to get there. Even though I've been gone for a week in South America, I come back and like, yeah, okay, I'm going to take a couple of days, hang out with my family, whatever. Oh, maybe I'll get one day this week at the studio. And like before COVID, there was a lot of guilt with that. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I got to get there. I've got this, the facility of my, the studio of my dreams is right down the street. Like I got to get there and use it. Now I'm like, nah, it's cool. If I don't make it there this week, I've got a day and a half plan next week. That's fine. What was the process in that <clears throat> mindset? Because I'm still trying to work that out if I'm honest. And I'm, I, I need all the help with that is that process of nah, it's okay. You're doing all right. Oh man. Well, listen, for me, it was, having time away from it during the lockdowns mm. was key for me, but also where I'm at in my career, <laughs> which I'm a madman yeah. in the way that for years, for people listening, look, North America has always been my stomping ground. Cause I'm from Chicago. I've lived in California for 20 
plus years. I was in yeah. San Francisco for 10 years. I've been down here for 12 years, whatever. Um, I was in Orange County for a few years. Um, so really, the bulk of my touring happens in Canada, US, Mexico, some South America stuff and some Asia stuff. As you kind of whittle that down, like the tricky thing with America is, it's like, dude, there's 30 markets you can hit here. Yeah. That's a lot. And it's a lot of traveling. You know, it's like, okay, cool. I'm only going to hit 12 markets this year of that. And, you know, I I just kind of had to like get comfortable with like, yeah, cool. I'm only going to play St. Louis once every three years. Like that's just, I just, I can't. I can only go to Dallas. I can only hit maybe Dallas. I can't hit Dallas, Houston, Austin. I can't hit all of these every single year. I mean, there's four or five cities in Texas you could hit. Yeah. San Antonio. I mean, and listen, these are all, dude, I'm sure you can relate to this. They're all, these are scenes that are worthy of hitting. I mean, you get a thousand kids in a room that haven't seen me for three years. They're pulling their hair out. They're, yeah. I'm dropping some song that's five years old, and these kids are flipping out because they've never been in the room with me. Rinse it, and like it's a moment for them. That song means something to them. So I kind of had to like figure out how to let go. And I don't listen. I don't have it totally figured out because you yeah. can see I'm talking about this. It's still hard for me. Like it's yeah, still yeah. like ah oh, man, how can I make the, these places? And it's just kind of prioritizing the stuff that's really important. Like, cool. I know New York, Miami, Chicago, San Francisco. Like, I take my top, like, eight markets in America. Okay, I know I got to hit them. Then I talk my top two or three in Canada. I, I got to hit Vancouver. I got to hit Toronto. Okay, cool. Um, you know, Mexico City. Okay, I got to go there once this year. You know, and then it's like my handful of Asia places. And then it's like cool, a few random opportunities that pop up that are just awesome. And I'll yeah. leave room for that stuff. And I think putting that in first, because then it's like studio time is easier to kind of like, oh, oh I correct. can have this yeah. fit in here. That can mold around these other big important pieces. Um, I don't know. It's really, oh, man, it's hard. But I think I, I have a little bit of an advantage because. Like I've, I've done it. I've been doing it for a long time. I don't, you know, like I, I I don't know. I tried like for, for, for many years, dude, a big thing that kind of like was this huge weight on me that I was carrying around was how can I break into Europe? Yeah. My records just like weren't, they weren't working as well there as they were here. Yeah. But then not only that, like I just was having a hard time finding part of it was my problem. Like I wouldn't go there and play all the clubs that have 500, 600, 700 kids that are important to play that kind of like ignite that fire and get fans there. Like, man, Cascade him here and he smashed it. I'll go listen to his thing or I'll pay attention to him. Like I just wasn't giving it the time. So for dude, for over a decade, I was like trying to make that happen. So I would spend a month over there, like messing around and like, I just, didn't have the right partnerships or the right look or whatever, but I still kept dedicating time to it. At one point I was just like, all right, I need to let these go. (laughs) It's like, (laughs) it's hard though, isn't it? Because I like in it. And I'm actually really glad you brought that up about Europe because I have the same conversation with my team about Europe, which is strange for me because obviously I'm English and my, biggest market is america and it has been since i started touring full-time since i became a full-time dj my biggest market was america and i've never been able to crack that europe kind of scene and i'm i'm still at the point where i'm still trying to i'm still like hopeful that there's there's an opportunity there but what came what was that moment in in your life where you're like you know what it doesn't matter in the bigger picture of your life anymore like what how did you get to that point dude i think i'm still having that conversation with myself <laughs> is that crazy it's totally it's so crazy. weird it's, it's it so doesn't weird. make any sense it's so <clears throat> stupid i i think i have to constantly convince myself that 
Like, it's okay. It's all right. Yeah. Um, but, but, but here, let me, but let me kind of tell you where my head's at. Let me like zoom yeah. out a little bit because to me, there's a few different ways that it happens, right? Yeah. Like I look at like Paul Fisher, right? He had a massive global hit. Yeah. Everyone was listening to, to lose it. And then the, the track before was even a smash, dude. That's the one where I started paying attention. Like, damn, this is freaking cool. You, yeah. you know, uh, Barkley put it out, uh, roller coaster. And I was like, oh, this is some shit, dude. This is dope, man. What, what, what is this? Who is this? You know, like I knew Cut yeah. Snake and I knew what they were doing. And then, oh, well, that's him. Okay, he's doing this, whatever. So I'm putting it together. But he had that kind of global smash. So then he could kind of step back in his team and design where they want to put their time into, right? Because wherever mm. he goes, there's going to be a lot of people that are interested in like, we'll show up at the club or festival to hear him drop that track and everybody goes yeah. crazy. Um, <laughs> or, hold on. Everybody loses it. Yep. So, uh, <laughs> so I think everyone in this industry probably hopes for secretly hopes and that the track they're working on will do that and have some major impact. And then they can kind of design where they want to spend their time. Yeah. I think there's those lightning bolt moments of lightning in a bottle moments only happen every so often, like every year or two, there's a dude who comes around and puts some song out that just like has global impact in from yeah. our scene. I mean, all the way back from like Robin us, show me love, you know, 30 years ago, yeah. boom, she put that out. It's like, ah, to, you know, let's say losing it or whatever, or, or even John summit tracks, uh, uh, this song that he's on right now. Um, so those moments happen, but I think what happens more regularly, it's where you're at and where you put the time in. Yeah, dude. Things happened for me in California because I was living in San Francisco and I was like playing my local market, putting out records. I was signed to a label in San Francisco. They were putting me on at showcases. I had my friends coming out. I was young. All my friends were working professionally. So, you know, I'm in my mid 20s, late 20s. So like when I played at the club, all my boys came out. It was a freaking rager Friday night. Yeah. Oh my gosh, this is sick. Promoters like, can we do this again in a month? Yes. Wow. Fast forward a month. And it builds from there. This guy's mm. got something going on. Cool. The guy invites me down to San Diego. My boys take the train down. We all go. There's 20 of us. Wow. It's crazy. I know some kids yeah. in San Diego. And then these things start happening. That's how it happens for most of us out there. It's like building these small moments and they get put together and then people start paying attention to music and promoters believe in you. So I think the idea of having this like global thing happen that way is so hard to like construct or try and be the architect behind that. It's almost impossible. Yes, it happens every once in a while. Sure. But really I feel like it's these guys that get, you know, there's a lot of luck in there where some track just mm. resonates with millions of people and then they can kind of design where they want to spend their time. Yeah. Um, so for the rest of us, I, you know, I don't know, man, it's, it's, it's do what you can do, get in where you fit in. Do you feel, this is a question for you. Do you feel like it was happening in America for a, because you were making American sound, they were more American style yeah. records or because you were putting records out on American labels and they mm. were inviting you to their parties and you were part yeah. of their showcases or their camp outs or whatever they were doing. So you were getting exposed to their kind of built in audience. Do you think that was the case with you? 100%. Yeah. I, I say this every time, like <clears throat> my touring career, not my career, but my touring career started when I signed records to Dirty Bird. And that was a specific um choice by me of where can i sign my records that can give me a, can help grow my career in a market um right and that was what i chose to do and, and it worked for me and i will always thank barkley and the, the dirty bird crew at that time for for helping me grow my career to where it is 
even though I don't release music on Dirty Bird anymore and my sound has changed massively, but that allowed <coughs> that allowed me to have a foundation in America, which I didn't have a foundation elsewhere. However, I do also think the way the business works in America compared to Europe is, and this is, I'd like to get your thoughts on this, but my thoughts of American agents compared to European agents just work very differently. And I, I, this, I don't want to kind of talk shit on anybody <laughs> at all, but American from, from my experience and I can only talk about my own experience, but I find American agents are willing to work on a project long term and grow it from the bottom, not jump on something just because it's successful at this time. Where my experience in European UK agents is that they take you on, but they're not really willing to work until something really is popping off in that market. That's my, that's purely my opinion. And that's all my experience. Um, so I think Amer and, and also the, the, the beautiful of the beautiful side of capitalism in America is something that isn't really the same in Europe and America and, and, and England when agents just want to fucking hustle. It's just it. And, and I think there's a dedication to uh, of agents in that way where even if, even if it's going to be a shit offer, even if it's a shit show, that they're off putting on the table, they're still putting offers on the table just to show that they're doing their job. And I think there's there's kind of difference in that. Yeah. My ex my experience has been similar to yours yeah. with that. Um and I, I, I think and I'm not to say that America's any better or that's no, not at all. I think at all. I think what I think what the deal is there is dude, we caught on to dance music so much later. Yeah. Like, even though we were in it, listen, dude. I, you started I it. Turned fi I, I turned it 53 this month. I grew up in Chicago. I was in high school from 85 to 89. Yeah. The stuff I was seeing in the clubs, dude, I started going out when I was 15 years old. Yeah. I, I saw... Dude, Frankie Knuckles was a resident at the teen club I was going to as a 16-year-old kid. I'm in there like, Frankie Knuckles is smashing it. Like, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I mean, I'm listening. I had no idea what I was a part of because it just, to me, that's like, that's what my reality was. I didn't know that this was some first wave of some movement that was taking over the world. I had no idea. But look, the, the, the scene here remained small for decades, but it kept it in a way that it was kind of cool like we yeah. had this little niche thing like that was just kind of doing its thing and you could make a living yeah. you know nobody was going to make a lot of money when i got into this i was like i'll never own a home but i'll be able to get a nice apartment and like oh, oh i can make a living and i was yeah. totally satisfied with that because i was doing it because i loved it i was like oh if i press some records and back then i was doing bootlegs i was mashing up tracks and pressing records i was making more money doing that than i was gigging <laughs> you know so i was like <laughs> i was hustling on that thing and whatever but i think the agent's mindset here is they've seen this slow growth and this burn so they're like yeah. oh cool if we put the time into this you know i mean dude the guys that manage john summit right now they were two tech bros yeah. You know, five years ago, they just found this guy on SoundCloud, like, hey, dude, you're doing some pretty cool stuff. Let me. This dude had nothing going on. He was yeah. Just some kid with a day job, and they liked the sound. They're like, let's get with this guy. We'll help him make it grow. Man, good, good choice. Smart thing. Yeah. I'm sure they worked hard for those opportunities, but it was like it worked. I think in the UK, you guys, and just Europe in general, like, dude, in the 80s, the stuff crossed over. Top yeah. of the pops, I look at this stuff of Farley Jack Master Funk like playing on TV, like these old things. I'm just like, my mind, it's hard to it's even crazy. imagine. It's yeah, just yeah. so, and it's awesome. There's an, uh, that's, you know, two different stories. One's not better than the other. They're just both amazing. But I think the agents 
now, every time I meet, you know, let's rewind 10, 15 years ago in my career where I was really starting, things were really starting to click here. And I'd be going to Miami for Winter Music Conference, Miami Music Week, whatever we're calling this thing. And I'm meeting with these European agents who have big acts around Europe. And they're like, yeah, you got something going on, but there's, you know, there's a little bit of buzz here for you. They're yeah. like, let me try you out. Yeah. And their version of trout is like, they would kind of just like glob me on to these. They already had like a roster that's just like rinsing it, you know, making yeah. tons of money. So they would just like throw me on these little things. I mean, dude, I had, <laughs> I've opened up for Geta, for Morales. I played at Pasha, a summer residency where I was opening up for the Def Mix guys. You know, nobody knows who I am. And I'm in there trying to like make my way. Um, then the Swedes, when they were first coming up, like I was getting on a lot of their stuff in Europe, opening up for them. Um, and you know, and none of it really panned out. But I think the agents thinking were, you know, whatever, I'll toss this kid a bone. And then if it like starts to catch, then I'll be here. You know, yeah. it's like they weren't the, the only way they could do anything with me is to you know, just kind of attach me to that. I mean, they're just, yeah, yeah. you know, a few hundred bucks here from bucket. And like, I was willing to put the time in to see if I could get something to happen. But listen, back then the world was a lot less connected. Like I didn't have much social media to even take advantage of those opportunities. Yeah. Like I could show myself like, Oh, I'm here at Pasha. In yeah, yeah, I, couldn't yeah, yeah. Do, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. Um, I think, I, yeah, no, I totally agree. And I think also, sorry to butt in, but I, I think <clears throat> what you were saying about electronic music being on TV over here and it being commercial to a certain extent. And I, what I've, although electronic music, house music, techno came from America and European culture kind of took it and especially Great Britain with rave culture and, and, and everything like that. I feel like nobody looks to America as as oh we need to see what America's doing when it comes to electronic music. Like I I, I live in Detroit or I used to live in Detroit. I will be moving back there soon, but my I had a housemate at one point who actually edits <laughs> edits this podcast. Um and he's like an insane techno producer absolutely insane techno producer like one of the best that i've heard it, like just sonically technically his live show is amazing but he's like the issue is is everybody in america that's booking techno is looking at what europe's doing and they're not looking at what's in their back door and you go Dude. to europe you go to europe and and England, and it's nobody's looking at going, oh my God, there's this new kid from Detroit that's releasing this sick music. Like, what is going is, oh, this new kid from Berlin, or this new kid from Bristol, or this new kid from London, or this new kid from wherever, apart from America. And it, it's really weird. And, and I'm not saying that there's right or wrong. I think it's a really nice conversation to have. But it just purely is that, that I think there's there's two, there's two multiple factors in it. But America in electronic music, although some of the biggest artists in the world, yourself including one of them, right, are from North America, yet, and can sell more tickets than most people in Europe, yet the that just doesn't correlate in european or british dance music culture which is strange to me it, it's it's baffling <laughs> and i have a few acts to grind with this like dude i could talk about this for and i and i <laughs> love ha i love having your 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 vantage point because yeah, yeah. you spent some time here yeah but you're from over there so it's like you have a really interesting perspective um and honestly, when you hit me up to do the podcast, I was like, oh, man, I'd, I'd, I'd love to have some of these conversations because your perspective is so it, – it's, it's interesting to me. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, and I, oh, I feel like 
as the scene kind of crested here in America and it's kind of crossed over now. Yeah. When I say crossed over, we still don't have a ton of dance music on the radio here. It's not considered no. pop music. We're still definitely like the redheaded stepchild of the music world. Like, yeah, you guys are cool, but it's not really music, really, yep. uh, you know. Um, so we're not, we don't have a ton of respect here, but we are moving a lot of tickets and things. We are moving the needle. I mean, dude, Elenium, kid from Denver just did two nights at SoFi Stadium. There's over 70,000 tickets. I mean, this is, that's pop act numbers. That's undeniable. Yeah. And I love seeing him do that. Another aspect of what you were saying, which has fascinated me because it's been this little seed of resentment here, <laughs> is <laughs> that here in the U.S., I believe that most kids in the scene, like the general kid who's going out, dance music is a European thing. Oh, we don't do yeah. that. Oh, he plays that, those European records. He doesn't. They have yeah. no. They have no idea of the history, where it came from. You know, we've got a rich history of dance music here. They don't know any of that. It's just seen as something that's European. Oh, I did. I went on a backpacking trip. Dude, they had like dance music on the radio and kids were, we went out and they took ecstasy. Like that's most Americans knowledge of dance music, which is a shame. Yeah. It's just like, I want to cry when I hear this. I'm like, dude, (laughs) we're, we're grinding. We're doing cool stuff over here too, man. Yeah. Yeah. But with that, there's a lack of pride for of American artists. Yeah. And the reason that bothers me is because I came up here. This has been my place and I, it it makes, it bums me out that like when Geta goes and plays Paris, it's a holiday. They shut the streets down. They call off work. It's a bank. I mean, dude, the guy plays and 15 million people show up. The whole country has a party. Like, look at this guy. He's on the world stage. He's a, a, a French man, a Parisian that did it. He's on the world stage. He went to the Grammys. It's like Americans could care less, dude. Yeah. I mean, dude, I have fans hit me up all the time. Like, I thought you were from Europe. What are you kidding me? I couldn't be <laughs> any more American. Like, what I, I got to get like a bald eagle tattooed on my right up here. Like, you know what I'm saying? USA. Like, what? Well, yeah. Oh, because I make house music. I'm European. Like, bro, give me a break, man. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I'm from Chicago. Like, I can't. <laughs> I'm eating a hot dog right now. I couldn't be any more American. Um, and and the reason that's a little bit of a bummer is because I feel like a lot of these Americans coming up could lean into that pride and sell more tickets and get a little bit more of a lift if there was some of that pride involved, where I feel like, you know, same thing. The French have a lot of pride about Daft Punk and, and the, yeah. the, you know, the cry to more sound and how that happened and, and, and what that is. Even dude, in Detroit, I mean, dude, it took Mm. so long for that festival, uh, DEMF, uh, you know, to to like really sprout and have like a moment. Now, Now it's up and running and it's cool and people respect it and it's awesome, but it's like, that thing should have been going on for 30 years. And yes, there should be a half a million people showing up and, and because what it represents, um, you know, a city with an insane history. Uh, yeah, with that music, that is, it's it's very interesting, isn't it? Because it is almost like <clears throat> I don't know. I th- I think we're probably the wrong people to kind of be talking, not talking about it, but hooting and hollering about it purely because we're a bunch of white dudes. But and and also, I'm not from America. But I think I having. St- Kevin Saunderson on the podcast, having Gene Farris, having Josh Wink on the podcast, having Dude, having... I would love to hear like what Kevin has to say about something like that. Like they have to be ten times more resentful towards the fact that they don't get celebrated like they should. I mean, at exactly. least me, I've made a living. I'm sitting here in my freaking fat house in West LA. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I've made a good life. So it's like cool. I need to check myself. Like, dude, I am thankful. I have been given so much. 
Thank you yeah. for all the people that came before me, and they, they paved the road. Dude, I would not be sitting here talking to you with all these guys who came before me. And which, by the way, a lot of Americans and Europeans, it's like all these guys kind of set this up to where it could become some massive thing that it is today. So props to all of them. I think just it's a little bit, it's a bit of a bummer that uh, some of these guys that kind of paved the way and, and, and beat down so many doors didn't get kind of, the, you know, the respect that they deserve. I, I totally agree, and it amazes me. It amazes me on... But I, I also think there was a level, a point in in American dance music culture where it just became very commercialized. And the the fruits, everyone had the fruits of the labor, but, but the the origins of that was never told and still isn't being told and there's nothing wrong that there is a lot to wrong with that but but i also think what edm culture actually also on a positive side of it brought to america is it actually brought electronic music back to america because it was fucking nowhere before that it was it europe had taken it all we 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 took it all like even speaking to kevin on the podcast like he was like Dude, I had to move to Amsterdam because I couldn't get booked in America. I had to go to Europe, like as in a city, like as. Their, and him saying records. that to you, the irony. You're over here. Yeah, I know. Do, yeah. Doing your thing. He's got to go over there. It's like, what's happening? Doesn't make yeah, sense. It's crazy. It doesn't make sense. But I, I and I, it's it's a conversation that I I love I love the conversation because there's no answers to it. Well, it's, dude, to me, it's this whole syndrome, part of it, whatever, a very small part of it, but it's this whole grass is greener thing. Yeah, oh, 100%. Man. Yeah, it, dude, oh, in Europe, dude, the, have you heard of this place, Ibiza? They got all these clubs. I'm like, yeah, I've been there a thousand <laughs> times, dude. Yeah, I know about Ibiza. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, I got it. It's amazing. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. You know, I went there two summers ago, dude. You've never seen anything like it. I haven't. Okay. You know, so yeah. whatever. It's always cooler somewhere else. Yeah, 100%. And, it, and, and, and I actually like that. It actually makes me laugh. And I think, I, I think that's, I think we need that in this culture because I think that the, it's, it's like, there was a there was a meme the other day that I saw on Instagram and, and John won't mind me saying this, but it was like a John Summit there was like a dude that commented on a John Summit um about going to a John Summit fest uh, show and it was like oh, I love techno so much. <laughs> and and like even John commented on it. It was it was kind of hilarious. And and the, the, but the thing is the naivety. I love the naivety. I love the fact that actually these kids. It can be called what the fuck you want. Call it what the yeah. fuck you want. It means yeah. nothing to any of us in the grand scheme of things because we all know where it came from. And it is our place to kind of to to push that the history. But you know what? Did you ever listen to history when you were at school? Like no. no one gave a fuck. You, the, the only reason why we know about history is because we became older and we got interested in it, right? Yeah. And and I think there's that's what the EDM culture did in America is it actually built a foundation of kids that were interested in electronic music again, yeah. and that allowed the likes of myself, like you were you were f kind of pushing that way it, to a certain extent of like building a scene back again for America and allowing dudes like me that wasn't in the EDM culture at that time that was making more underground records an opportunity to tour in America because the promoters were like, oh, cool, what's this dude doing now? And these kids that came to, sh came to EDM shows that... And then was intrigued into the history, intrigued into learning a little bit more about digging deeper, the dubstep phase of America. Like, although so okay. many people talk so much shit on it, like, it, it brought so many people to this scene that 
and now listening to our your records, my records, and everything. And I think there is there is a beautiful side to it, to all of it as well. Although you can we can all laugh about it, but I think half the reason why I have success is because of that. Yeah, I, listen, there's no Elenium selling out two nights at SoFi Stadium here in Los Angeles unless there's a Skrillex, you know, 10 years exactly. before him. Yeah. So these things all kind of set one another up. Um, yeah. So it's cool. And I agree with you. It's like, at the end of the day, what does any of it matter? It's just yeah. like, okay, cool. I'm just really stoked and thankful that kids are paying attention um, mm. and that I can have a career whatever, man, making records, going out there and playing them. I have lived some kind of insane life. I mean, it's yeah, nuts. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah, it's, it's crazy. And it's, it's really interesting as well. And I've got friends that their first introduction to electronic music was you. And yeah. it's, it's kind of, it's, how does that feel? Um, it's cool. It's awesome. I love, I, I, you know, I get those stories from time to time. It's one of the, I hate social media because <laughs> it's something <laughs> that takes time away from doing things that I love, but it, yeah. it, it's important. But the one thing I do love about it is it allows us to connect and I can hear stories like that. And when I log on there, I search for kind of stories like that. Like, you know, the first song I ever heard was 4 a.m. And I heard that and I fell in love with electronic music. I went and bought that album, Strobe Light Seduction, and it changed yeah. my life. And like, dude, it never gets old. I hear this stuff all the time. I think I was really fortunate that uh, I was kind of on that. It's cool. I was... I was with Ohm Records and Mark Farina and Derek Carter and doing this kind of boomty Chicago stuff. Yeah. But I was like taking it from more of a songwriting approach. And I was fortunate because as kind of electronic music was rising, the thing that could cross over in America, and I think there's a lot of reasons for that. One of them is Sirius XM having a radio that 20 million people were subscribing to that had a, a dance station. And they yeah. were playing so much of my music because I was song based. I was a songwriter. I was approaching it from a songwriter because I, I knew that was my angle. I was like, okay, I enjoy yeah. writing songs. Everyone's making beats. I'll make beats and I'll put it together. I'll write a song on top of that. That was kind of like, I understood that when I moved to San Francisco, I was like, this is my path. I think yeah. here's where I'm going to be able to fit in. Um, because there was a handful of dudes doing that. Um, Naked Music on records. There was kind of like this, Miguel Miggs was having a moment. Um, Solstice, the band was having a moment, which, listen, there was a lot of stuff overseas that was kind of mirroring that. That was San Francisco's version of that. Um, anyway, what am I saying? I, I think the timing was really good for me because yeah. people who want more than just like some drums that aren't just like EDM people, but sonically we're looking for something interesting. So they yeah. follow electronic music. And then I had songs on top of there that could easily kind of like grab onto that. Mm. So I kind of opened up the door for, you know, a lot of people in their twenties. And then I think, uh, Apple music was a big deal for me, kind of like online and streaming stuff. And those guys pushed, uh, that strobe light seduction, that album, they really, I mean, dude, it was on the front page of the dance thing for like a month. So anyone yeah. who logged on was like, what is this? And there were some, you know, I collaborated with Dead Mouse with on two songs on that album and, you know, whatever the guy's wearing a glow, glow in the dark helmet of the shape of a mouse. It's like, there were a lot of things that kind of just were stoking interest. So and that was 2008, right? Uh, Somewhere around there, oh was, yeah, yeah, oh seven, oh eight. So, yep, that's about. It was kind of like that's when things were night, heating up. Bring the night album, two thousand and seven. Yep. Strobe that's light. A mix comp. Yep. Yeah, and then strobe light, two thousand and eight. Yeah, so that was a big, big huge year. year for me. Yeah. My introduction to you was I remember, 
as I'm sure it was a lot of people's introductions. Um, yeah. I remember the first time I heard it, I was a, I was re- had a, had my residency in Ibiza at that time, and I was. I think I got sent. I got. It was when. I think I probably still have it somewhere. When you <coughs> at residencies in Ibiza back then, you'd have promo guys, and obviously instead of getting emails you would get a dude that would come around with a bunch of cds yeah and you'd have to get that you'd get those cds and then put your reaction on it um i i got that on a on a cd and remember listening to it and that was when also when dead mouse was was popping off at the same time yep um and i that record just completely changed ibiza that year completely um wow yeah it was crazy i i i never forget that it was it was the it was almost like cascade dead mouse and i was like what can't like dead mouse was having his time anyway at that time he was like coming through and then that came and it was almost like both your worlds collide and was like fuck like these guys can't do anything wrong um did it feel like that when it actually happened? Not quite like that. Um, I knew it was a big moment. Listen, yeah. Dead Mouse sent the instrumental to me. Let me give you a little bit of back. I've told this story a thousand times, so I'll give you the super short version. I approached him because he was having a moment on Beatport, and that's when Beatport yeah. was so important. Because it's globally, we could see what was trending for the first time ever. But yeah. prior to that, you remember, dude, you'd have to go to the record shop and be like, what's happening? Yeah, yeah. Oh, this record's big, that record's big, whatever. And you're having these conversations with all the dudes that like live, eat, and breathe this, you know? Yeah. Um, but now we had that global trending barometer of the top 10. And he'd had a couple things hit. And I approached him and I'm like, dude, f- f- to me, faxing Berlin... I heard Faxing Berlin and I was like total Chicago house guy at this point. I'm yeah. like, bump it, dump it, dump it. I mean, just like, that's all I'm making. I heard that and I was like, what is happening here? This sound design yeah. is some other, totally other thing. Because in our world and in like, generally speaking, in most Americans' world and certainly in the producer realm, trance and what was going on in Europe, we just looked at it as like garbage. We were so yeah. like, that stuff was so, it's fast, it's super synthetic, it's not cool, <laughs> it's like this Euro trashy, like that stuff's weird and like, we just didn't get it. Like, we're over here like, oh, Scott Stone, Scott, you know. Yeah. And you were also very right. Let's just be honest. <laughs> we're, we're, we're very <laughs> <laughs> we just didn't like we just trance just like wasn't working here really in the cool yeah. cir- cool guy circles in the big clubs whatever it was like smashing it whatever and the like yeah. four or five of those in in the u.s <laughs> and so when i hit up dead mouse i'm like dude i send me something i'll write a song over this uh, let me write yeah. something man that i've got 10 different girls I'm working with. Anyway, he sends it over and I was like, oh, the chords on this are so freaking sick. I write something that night, record it the next day, send it to him like two days later, three days later. He's like, oh, this is shit hot. And I'm like, dude, this is so, this is such a record, right? I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, and dude, I didn't know Dead Mouse something to that. I mean, I, I, this is all happening over freaking AIM was all over yeah. instant messenger, like going back and forth. And for me, it changed things in America immediately mm. for sure. Like, cool. So it changed things. But to me, I still was like, I saw dead mouse playing in Europe a lot. And I was like, yeah. man, I'm not getting the calls that he's getting. And the way it kind of seemed from my vantage point certainly changed my life, dude. And like, in so many ways, but I was like, oh, in Europe, they think I'm the person singing that song. They don't know that I'm just like a producer, that I'm a songwriter, that I'm like just a producer, that I'm just this dude doing this. So a lot of the gigs, I'd go to Europe and they're like, are you going to sing? And I'm like, what the? (laughs) The guy would come to pick me up at the airport like, 
what? And I'm like, yeah, dude, what? What do you, what do you, what, what? Yeah. What do you so think? I had a lot of weird moments on the road. And even for me, it really, dude, I'm showing up and I'm, you know, Chicago, Derek Carter records, a lot of yeah. like what the Wicked Crew was doing, a lot of like Naked Music on records, some of the stuff that was happening down in LA. So I was still very housey. And yeah. that was like kind of this smooth, proggy stuff. So I s quickly had to start like really learning more about that sound and working it into my sets. What I thought was interesting about Dead Mouse's sound when I reached out to him, I was like, to me, it was like house. It just was more synthetic. Like I, I totally understood it. Like I was instantly intrigued, but it didn't feel like a really big departure from what I was doing. It just yeah. had more reverb on it. Like, you know, like <laughs> it was less sampley and more synth based, but I was like, that's cool. Yeah. I can get with that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it definitely changed things, but it, but dude, it's back to that previous conversation. It was more, it changed things for me kind of just in, in my world, just expanded. It didn't necessarily bring me overseas. And when it did, it just was a lot of awkward nights and weird conversations. I mean, I played a ton of gigs and, 2009, 2010, 2011, I was going over to Europe a lot more, but it just, I, I didn't have the shtick. I didn't have the mouse head. I didn't have, yeah. like, I was still just like this dude showing up in a black t-shirt, like ready to like yeah. grind it out at three in the morning. Like I didn't, I don't know. I was still like this just kid from San Francisco, like playing cool records. Like, I don't know. I didn't. Yeah, the whole like show phase of what I was doing hadn't hadn't gotten hadn't there gone yet. There. Yeah. yeah, what? So moving on from that, and I, and I'm sure you've told these stories a million times, and I'm sorry, but I I don't know no, this, and good. I'm just good, really really intrigued. Um, <clears throat> but at what point did you, were you like, I need to make a show of Cascade. I need to I need to really make this. A, a brand, I guess, use it yeah. without sounding too wanky. It was all at that time, those years following that. Yeah. Well, I could see, obviously, everyone saw what Daft Punk did, right? Yeah. And listen, in the US, all the Chicago dudes sneak, I mean, the original guys, they were all yeah. down with Daft Punk, right? That wasn't this like Euro cheese stuff. That was dope. And that's cry to more yeah. and all dude, there were so many French labels doing disco and quite frankly, they were doing it better than what the Chicago guys were. They were filtering yeah. the stuff better. The mix downs were better. The records were punchier. The, the arrangement was better. It's like, they just were like taking, it was like Chicago 2.0. But anyway, we were looking, I was looking at all that and I'm like, Oh, this is going bigger. This is things yeah. are happening. I need Cascade just isn't like me showing up and being a cool guy and playing a couple of cool records at two o'clock in the morning. This is, I gotta get like press shots. I gotta grow my team. I gotta be up on social media. This is, this is a thing. And it really kind of coincided. Talk about giving people props. Like Donnie's one of the promoters, disco Donnie here mm. that like, He's been in the trenches for 30 years. Pasqual Rotella, yeah. who owns Insomniac, another guy. I mean, I've known Pasqual for almost 25 years now. This guy's been booking me playing shows, which is mind boggling. But um, they're the guys who like really put in the work. But I remember going to EDC and I was playing on some little side stage, whatever. But I walked into the Coliseum and I watched what was happening. And I was just like... I mean, it just like cracked my head open and was like, yeah. okay, the interest is here for me. How do I do from, you know, the thousand person club that's like going off a sweaty night to, to this, a stage, a show, a presentation, a whole experience. Like, how do I do that to this? And that's just really kind of. Luckily, I had a lot of really cool people around me. Um, I had a guy, my creative director for many years, Lauren Cronk. Um, dude, I was the first guy to, I like saying this on podcasts and stuff because because it's one of my little claims to like, ah, I did this. I was the first guy to show up to EDC where I was like, I actually have my own visuals. Yeah. And they're like, 
I'm sorry, what? And we had advanced this because prior to that, everyone just showed up and they put, they had one visual guy for the entire festival. No one showed up mm. with their own visuals. And I'm like, no, no, no. While I play Angel on my shoulder, I have this specific graphic that this guy is going to put on and he's going to tap it in. The The, the software at the time was in beta. It was so new. Yeah. And like I paid this kid, Mike Burkoff, incredible, and Lauren Cronk kind of, we all gathered around and I'm going to play these 10 songs and I want these specific graphics. And we started coming up with stuff, but it was all kind of coincided with this huge you know, wave of popularity with EDC. Um, yeah. And that, that's really when I was like, okay, so, you know, early 2010 is when I'm like, all right, this is, this is bigger than me. <laughs> I need to become yeah. cascade, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's that transition though. Was there any point in, in that transition where you're like, Am I doing the right thing? Or oh, is it, was it the case of, I need every, to do this? It is what Every it is. day, dude. I'm sure every artist out there second guesses themselves. But I don't spend a lot of time doing that. I'm like, I'm a person who's constantly in motion. I'm like, next, next, next. I don't, I don't, if I made a mistake, I don't have time to think about it. I'm just like, let me correct in the future. I'll just course correct, whatever. Just... I'm all about next. What's next? What's next? Yeah. Keep going, keep going, keep going. So, um, yeah, I just, if I was like, man, I wish I would have done that. Okay, cool. How can I avoid doing that in the future? I'm always like, okay, what can I learn from, you know, these things? But yeah, I just was like, what's Men next? <laughs> on, on that what's next, I can relate massively. And I think my team kind of hate me for it to a certain extent <laughs> um but how is the what's next can be extremely mentally draining Ugh. um like on another level and to the extent where like i was i was having a joke earlier with one of my friends she was like talking about a record that's recently come out and she was like oh it's doing really well and i'm like it's doing all right like could be doing better, could be doing worse. It's doing all right. And and she was like, why can't you just accept that it's doing well? <laughs> and my, my manager hates me for this. <laughs> um, and, and I think, bear in mind, people that are listening, this is being recorded in February. This is not when it, this is being released. So we're talking about very different records. But um, I think, like, how how have you dealt with that mentally of the what's next thing because you've had some huge moments in your career song wise show wise and when you're at the top the pinnacle of a scene which you you were or are at like there's not much bigger right than where you have where you can go how is that mentally Ah, thank you. <laughs> That's nice of you to say. Uh, I think it's really hard. Uh, I think it's been a challenge. I think, like you, it's extremely difficult for the people around me. And this is something yeah. that I've had to step back and be like, okay, cool. As a person, I need to do better at this. I mean, literally, I'm finishing my night in 2012. I'm the first guy to sell out Staples Center in our genre. And they're presenting me some big plaque and this thing, you know, and I'm playing in front of 18,000 people, whatever. Like that night, we check in, we kind of finish the hurrah, whatever, the show is over. We're kind of coming down, you know, two hours later, like, okay. And I've got my team around me. And I'm like, all right, cool. What are we doing in San Francisco? Like, what's going on with this? Where's that remix at? Did they send me the stems? And these guys are like, dude, are you kidding me? Because I get yeah. it. N Listen, now that I've had more time in my, you know, whatever, 10, 12 years ago in my youth, it's just like, it's important to take those moments and celebrate the victories. Like, cool. Wow. We just did that. And kind of sit yeah. in it and enjoy it. Um, I think for me and that what's next, what's next, it's, it's easy to turn the page really quick. 
and quicker than the people that are around you because they, they've helped you get there. Right. So it's important that they yeah. feel like they're ready to like move on to the next thing as well. And that you stroke them and that you have that moment and like say, thank you and appreciate everything that they added there. I, I think it's been a challenge, you know, people working with me because I'm always like, that was awesome. Thank you. We crushed it. Woo. Yeah. Let, next thing. What's up, man. We're, we're moving yeah. to Chicago. We got the show in two months. Like where's the visuals for that? You know? And I'm like, ah. so I think that's hard. I think it's, it is yeah, exhausting. It's really hard. Whatever. I think that's one of those things that when I took, you know, 2022 off and or 2020 and like, like, okay, cool, I can do this better, and I need to enjoy these moments. I mean, even, listen, for me, we're just recording this shortly after the Grammys. Um, I went to the Grammys on Sunday, and it's my seventh trip going there, my eighth nomination, and it's always a really, really hard day for me because mm. the pageantry of this, of like, okay, we get dressed up and we pat ourselves on the back and tell each other how awesome we are. It's like, it's a really, it's just not who I am. I don't. Yeah. But I've had to be like, look, the first time I went, I came home and I was like, I, I hate this. I'm never going again, but I've had to reframe it in my mind and be like, nah, man, this is cool. Even though it, that award doesn't mean anything to me, this hardware, it's what it symbolizes. It's what that day symbolizes to me and my team. All this hard totally. work through the year or years that we've been together, let's take a day, let's have a nice meal, let's get dressed up and go and listen. Even though I go there and I like, I don't have barely anything in common with almost anyone in this room. Our experiences are so different. Like, we're, yeah. like are we even in the music industry? Like we make music, we both listen to the end product. Like, like it's just yeah. such a different thing that it's hard to feel like some kind of kinship with these people. But what I've reframed it as is like, let's take a moment and a breath and really enjoy the successes that we've had together. So it's cool because I have my team fly in. You know, they're not from here. He's from Toronto. My manager's from Toronto, but my agent's here. And like we all fly in and we kind of just enjoy the day. We have a big dinner the night before. And we tell stories about, remember that time in Europe where they thought you were going to sing? Like, you know, and we, and, and we share these things and it's kind of cool to take that moment. You can't yeah. be running around all the time because all you're going to do is just piss everyone off around you and you're going to be exhausted yourself. So It's precious. It's precious moments like that. And <clears throat> I think it, there is, a, a, I, for me, I can only speak for myself, it's, sometimes very hard for me to sit in the moment um and enjoy the journey and enjoy the moment and it's, it's the one thing that i don't really like giving advice and i know that my advice will always go unheard not unheard but unnoticed purely because everyone has to work it out themselves that's my view on advice generally but when somebody asks me like what what how do you become successful in the music industry or what bit of advice would you give give to me it, it would always be try and enjoy the moments in the journey because there's been plenty of moments for me plenty of times for me where it's just like i've enjoyed i've enjoyed it but I'm not thinking like I'm on stage thinking about why am I not on this? Why am I not? Why am I on this stage? Not this stage. <laughs> why am I playing at 10 PM instead of 1 AM? That bitch over there exactly. is playing at 1 AM and I've got seven records and I've been doing it 10 years longer. Yeah, dude. exactly. And exactly. it's dude, how many times are the people that are listening to this or you or I, how many times have you read, enjoy the journey, enjoy yeah, yeah. the fruits of this because you're never going to be right here in this moment a thousand times. And you're right. But yeah. literally, if you can take anything away from this podcast is that because that time what I spent in my basement, I wouldn't change it for anything. Those five years where I was like gaining weight and eating pizza every day. But it's like, <laughs> dude, what a time, you know, like what? Yeah. Like I wouldn't be here if I didn't have that. And it was fun. 
and silly and yeah. stupid. And I did stay up all night working on some remix that was due the next day. And like, and it still yeah. sucked. And like all of those mistakes or errors or it's like, yeah, you need to embrace it because those are the moments 100%. that really kind of define th this whole process. So I don't know me just with age, I think comes a little bit, you know, learning to do that better. I mean, I think yeah. I had the most fun at the Grammys this year than I've ever had. The last two times that I've gone, I've been able to bring my, this time I brought my entire family. Uh, the last time my littlest one was too small, but I mean, I'm there, I've got my wife and my three girls. And for me, the most rewarding part was is seeing my girls on the red carpet and they were just like, dude, they were loving it. And I'm like, this Love is so that. cool when they get older, older, you know, They'll be like, my dad took me to the Grammys and like, I'm just like, yeah. this is, this, it's not about me. It's, it's like this, I'm making these memories and having this cool moment. It's not about me. Like who cares, man? Whatever. Like, I don't care. dude. Like it's cool. No, it's yeah. Me. I love that. I love that because none of, and it really thinking about it, none of what we're doing is about you and I, none of it. We play records to thousands of people, hundreds of people, thousands of people, tens of thousands of people. And we're, we're not there for me. I'm not there for me. I'm there for them. I'm there to play music for them. And I have to come, I have to turn on the minute I get on stage. You have to turn on the minute you get on stage. Because if you're not there, they're not going to have a good time. And they have to have a good time. It's exactly the same with what you're saying about your family. It's like, you're not doing it for you now. You're doing it for them. You're doing yeah. it to make those memories for them, which is, is so precious. And I think, I think if you, that's about, for me, it's just about taking the ego out of it. Yeah. And it's like, none of, the, none of these people are here to see me. I'm here to play music for them. And hopefully they fucking like it. If not, I'm, I'm <laughs> game over. Yeah. I'm playing at 9 p.m. next year. <laughs> <laughs> um, KX5, I feel like we have to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Escape. It's a big record. Crazy record, man. Yeah. Crazy record. Um, what do you want do to you know? Do you history behind that? <laughs> oh, there's history. There's a lot of history. <laughs> um... <laughs> Joel and I, whatever we wrote, I remember move for me, you know, 15 years ago. Um, I always thought there's an opportunity for us to do things more together. Yeah. Um, but really he was on that rocket ship, especially 15 years ago. I mean, it was so, and when somebody's burning really hot, it's hard to be like, Hey, I'm not burning as hot as you, but let's do some stuff together. That never really works. Like yeah. you have to both feel like you're getting something out of that for the collaboration to work well. Um, so anyway, now, you know, fast forward 15 years, whatever, 12 years. And it was like, Hey, let's do some stuff together. He played me the song escape. He was in LA, he came to the studio. He's like, Hey man, what do you think of this? And it was in pretty demo mode. He'd worked on it, but he's like, I don't totally know how to like wrap this up. Like, I don't, I can't see it cause I've been in it. I've had the record for like a year. It's like, I don't know what to do. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, stem it out. Let me just sit with it for a minute. And I kind of added that last like 20%, 30%. I got it to the yeah. finish line. I sent it to him and he's like, F yeah, dude, this is it. This is what it needed. And I was like, cool. And then I'm like, dude, I've got a handful of tracks laying around that I think are special. I don't totally know what to do with these. Maybe we do more than just a song. Maybe let's turn this into an idea, you know? And I kind of came to him like, you know, like, name it something. And then we could like play some festivals and shows under this name, whatever. So we kind of started spitballing. I sent him some songs. He sent some stuff back and we kind of went back and forth. Um, and I think, I don't know if you agree with this, but I feel like the whole back to back thing is just in the last, you know, four or five years just become really kind of like, Oh, this is another cool outlet. It's a thing that's happening. People can yeah. do it. And we didn't, Joel was very, I mean, you know, Joel, <laughs> he's got ideas and he wants to do it his way. 
which is cool. He's like, dude, let's make it more like a band. And I'm like that I'm all on board with that. I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, but I knew people would be open it because the whole back to back thing was so prevalent now. Um, yeah. So anyway, we put the record escape out, it gained traction. Uh, it did well. Um, you know, we kind of produced it in a way that I thought the older fans would appreciate. I mean, it sounded like I remember 2.0 or move for me 2.0, like in that yeah. same kind of production style, but a 2023 version of it or 2022, yeah. you know, so I was happy with it. Um, yeah. And then we went out and did a couple of shows and I mean, the interest is there. We're going to do, I think we've got one or two shows scheduled for this year as well. It's kind of like now we're just more like, okay, let's see where the interest lies. And, you know, we'll kind of take it there. Last year was a big push. We rolled it out and did those shows. And now we're just like, let's see, let's see what, you know, what bubbles up. Yeah. Amazing, man. You Do you, do you know my relationship with Escape? I don't. Tell me, dude. This you is great. The... When you're saying history, you were talking about that. Give me the history. Did, did you did you do a demo of it? Did you have, you have that record? It's... I have not. I've never looked at <laughs> Look the credits. Dude. Are you in there? Are you a songwriter on that? Yeah. This is insane. So do you know Halo? <laughs> You can't even believe I'm putting this together right now. For the I've never looked at the credits. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it was originally a Will Clark song. Wow. Yeah. Crazy, hey? So, how, so did the vocal come to... How did Hala... How I did wrote you, it. There was four of us in the studio and we wrote it together. Wow. Who yeah. else is a writer on this? Camden Coxon on that, or because I Camden and Camden and Eddie, Eddie Jenkins. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. crazy. Yeah. It's, so did you come up with it? Did you guys, it, dude? Hey, Hala smashed it. The performance is awesome. She's the best, man. She's she's. That was my first session with Hala, and she was at that point in her career and she won't mind me saying for saying this about her, but she was a singing teacher, um, in Liverpool or Manchester at the time. And we'd just got in the studio together and we were sat outside and like, I'd heard her voice. Like it was, it's a fucking amazing voice. And I was like, she was like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm an R in about moving to London because I kind of want to try this whole like singer songwriter thing out properly, like full time. And I was like, you have to move to London. Like you can't do this living in, living in the North of the UK. You, you have to go full in on London. Yeah. Go in on do it. This. Like yeah. go in. And yeah, that was, that was the first session we did together. Um, and yeah, you're, it was like, you're blowing my mind right now. This is awesome. It was, so wh hold on. But then my question is, so when you finish the session, yeah, you come up with escape. Do you feel yeah. like, Hey, this is my record. I think I could put this out. Or are you like, man, we should shop this around. This is a pop record. Like Britney Spears could cut this or Beyonce. Were you guys like, Whoa, this is a, a, another thing. We've, we hit something here. You want the honest truth? Um, which nobody really knows publicly and <clears throat> this can cut, be cut out if not. And, and I'm more than happy for it to be cut out. It was supposed to be a Will Clark release. And then one of the writers got wind that it could be a little bit more successful than just a Will Clark release and completely blocked the record, blocked me from, from releasing it. Hey, listen, if it makes you, I think this should be in the podcast. I don't know. Probably somebody will get pissed, but if it makes you feel any care. better, dude, this has happened a dozen times to me in my career. Yeah. yeah. Cause I, I really I, like, I, imagine, I, man. I enjoy the songwriting process and what's even yeah. crazier. So when you sit in there and you're collaborating, you're writing a song and then somebody's like, Oh, you know, some manager gets in one of the writers here that you don't know. This could be huge. We're going to pitch it to freaking Beyonce or whatever, whatever they say. Listen, yeah. this goes back to the ego part of it, right? If you could remove that, whatever. But 
it's a shame because I would say 99% of the time in my experience, nothing ever happens with the records. Nothing. They go on to do yeah. nothing. And I'll go back and visit them three years later. Like, whatever happened to this? Nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like... Yeah, so you could get your ego stroked by some guy that's trying to make you some money, like whatever. Like I told you, man, we should have put this out three years ago. Yeah, I'm not even interested anymore. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's a crazy, but I think the thing for me is like, I by the time it, because it initially went to Joel, initially. Yeah. Um, And then there was, an, there was something that happened there that it didn't go to Joel. And then it went to Chris Lake. Yes. And Chris, it, it, the interesting thing with it. Chris is, yeah, Chris and I are pretty close. And also Chris <laughs> started the management, Chris, Chris started the management company with my manager that they, that Ryan is not well, initially started before he moved to 360. Um, and then Ryan told Chris about the whole drama behind this record. And Chris was like, fuck that. I don't want anything to do with this record. And then, I got to the point where <clears throat> I was like, I moved on from the, from the record. Like I loved right. it. I loved it. Right. Like, I, I, I loved it. But like you said, we moved on. Like these things happen. We write so much music that, that we all move on. Um, and then all of a sudden I was like, oh, Cascade and Dead Mouse want to do something with it. I'm like, cool, crack on. And then I heard it. I was like, this is perfect. This, this makes sense. And you know what? If I take my ego out of it, <clears throat> the record, I, I, I don't know, which is the beautiful thing, but the record, my version of the record wouldn't have done what you guys have could, what you guys have done with the record, which means that the record wouldn't have been heard by as many people. It wouldn't have been as successful. And at the end of the day, for me, it's all about the record. It's all about how many people get to listen to that record. And that moment that we had in the studio, although yes, there's some very salty conversations has happened since that <laughs> record got written. Right. Like the record is a beautiful record and it's got a platform that was way is and was way bigger than mine at the time. And it's fucking done so well. Dude, it's done so well. Ma massive tune. You're, you're a good man and you're in a good spot, dude, that you could say that because a lot of people, they hold on to that and it's hard yeah. for them because when you do take the ego out of it, really and truly, that's it. But listen, because it's working for you either way. It's out there doing its thing and you're collecting your publishing checks and whatnot. And like you moved on and you're going to make more records. It's like, it doesn't. Yeah. And I, the few records that got away from me, I'm kind of like, there's nothing to be bitter about. It's cool. I participated. No. I did my thing and that's awesome. Like let it like some pop star has a much bigger platform than, than I do. Like they're going to play yeah. for millions of people. That's awesome. Let them do it. So. Yeah, and and I think is I think it's it to be able to get to that point about how you look at music is really important to me because I think it, it's not that important. It's only fucking house music. <laughs> that we're, so that's it, dude. Th you got wars exactly. raging, stuff's going on. Exactly. Like we're just screwing around in the club on the weekend trying to have a good time. Like, honestly, man, all the rest of it's just like noise. That's why I'm like, whatever. Yeah, I love it, man. I love it. Um, what's I'm, your... I'm stoked to, I'm Don't. stoked that you got to tell that. Dude, I'm so glad we put that together. I had no idea. I'm, I'm amazed because, yeah, I love that you didn't know because I, I genuinely thought that you would know that there was like that I was part of it, which is why I thought you is the reason why you spoke to me in the first place. <laughs> like I was like, I was like, yeah, clearly he's talking to me because he knows that I helped write Escape. Um, but yeah, this that's amazing. I'm, and and I'm also I'm I'm really glad that you guys got the record because uh, uh, there was nobody else that i think 
would have been able to make that record still sit so well in the electronic music world but have a huge commercial appeal to it as well it's a good one well thank you for it's writing that or no, thank you participating in the writing I- it's <laughs> awesome it's a great record and it's cool that you were there for Hela, dude to kind of help she's and great she, man she's, she's great she's, she's 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 making some moves it's fun to see yeah i was talking to her last night actually and she's like it's amazing to see i'm so happy for her. she's one have you like spent much time with her uh, a little bit on those first few performances we kind of got to hang out a little bit not much but a little yeah you know, she's she seems like Dude, a great girl get her in the studio like just everything that comes out of her mouth is just sounds like it's from heaven. It's ridiculous. I love that. I've got so many ses- I've got so many sessions with her and you're just like, Oh man, it's just you could just listen to the voice. It's so good. There's and there's not many people out there that have that they they write music for their voice. They don't write music for anybody else. Right. It's purely for them and their voice fits their lyrics and fits their songs. And if somebody else writes music for them, it doesn't really work. And there's just not many artists that, that can do that. And, and she can just do that in a whole, whole nother level, man. I love it. Yeah. Um, so going back to what you were saying with regards to planning your years out, um, I know this isn't coming out in February, but we're in February now. How differently did you look at planning 2024 out? And, and what's, the, what's the goal for 2024 for the Cascade project? Um, yeah, I, I think I'm in this space now where I want to get a handful of new songs out this year. Um, you know, I've always been an album guy. Uh, mm. just because I like working on albums because you can be like, cool, you can sit in the studio and write and write and write. And out of that process, you're going to have one or two or three songs on that album that work at one thirty in the morning or two in the morning. And it's a hands in the air kind of like, yeah. yeah. And so I haven't put an album out in six years, but for the first 15 years of my career i was putting on an album about every year year and a half i was just like album album album. because instead of like going to have that pressure of like i gotta make a single i was like i'll just make an album and then we'll get some bits in there that's how i work when Mm -hmm. the listening you know changed for everyone uh how people consume music it was so singles based it's been really difficult for me to kind of manage that process um uh so now I, I kind of said in an earlier interview, I, I forget what it was. I really want to put out a record this year. I don't think it's going to happen. I'm looking at my year. I think it's probably going to come out at the beginning of next year. Um, but cool. I'm going to be writing a lot this year with that goal in mind. If it happens at the end of the year, yeah. great. If not, great, whatever. It'll happen early next year. Yeah. I'll get there. Um, I'm not one of these guys. I like to have like, cool, I'm going to write for these two months and that's going to be the album. That's kind of how I typically do it. Um, um, so that's, I've set time aside this summer. Um, it's going to happen. Amazing. I've got a few things in the oven, some kind of interesting collaborations. Um, those will be coming out this year. So I'll have a handful of singles come out this year and that'll either culminate in a, an album or early next year. And then, you know, yeah, then I'm doing about, I don't know, Probably around 60 shows here in North America and then probably another 20 or 30 shows outside the U.S., you know. Um, so I'm kind of like number. keep that balance. Yeah, I, to, for me, the magic number is right around 80 um, where I feel like, yeah. oh, I have a life. And I've learned that yeah. since the lockdowns. Like, oh, I have a life. I have a studio. I can still, like, do things and have relationships. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, I think it's also having being able to catch up with friends as well as family. I, th- I know obviously family is important, but I think the dynamic of spending time with friends is so important, which I think <clears throat> it gets really kind of messed up in our touring world because some friends come on tour, but then still you're touring. Like I've got, I get quite a few friends, especially in the UK, that because I don't get the chance to see them, when I do do a show in Europe, they all come 
or when I do a sh- show in the UK, they all come, right. which is great. I fucking love it. But like, it's still work. Yeah. For for us, yeah. and there's still that no time to switch off. And I think for me is like making sure making time to see friends and family, obviously, but like friends just to get that time in is so important. It's a, it's a big deal and was overlooked by me for a, a long, long time. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I am in that mode now. So trying Love it. really hard to strike the balance. Right. Cool, man, dude, let's wrap it up. We've just done an hour and a half. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, really look forward to catching up in person at some point um, yeah but yeah this was awesome man thanks love, for man. the invitation loved it thank thanks for coming on big love man all right thanks and that's a wrap big love to cascade for coming on thanks for listening please share it please send it to your people uh hit like hit subscribe till next time people keep safe